Good evening, everyone. Happy to have you here for the Siegel Lecture. Before we begin our program, uh, the first AME Church has uh, a special presentation I would like to make to our Siegel Lecturer, who is also Reverend Jennifer Bailey, who is an African Methodist Episcopal ordained clergyman. So on behalf of the local AME Church, I'm inviting Diane McMillan to come forward to make a presentation to our speaker. Good evening. I am making this a presentation on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reverend Willie A. Golston II, and, on the, and, and it says on our plaque, it says, the first community African Methodist Episcopal Church family recognizes Reverend Jennifer Bailey for service social and social action ministry to humankind, given on this day of March 30th, 2016. We would like to welcome you to our community and hopefully we'll get to see you at First Community African Methodist Episcopal Church sometime. Many of you know that the Siegel Lectureship has been going on for a number of years. And this is the first year that we're combining the Siegel Lecture, which has been sponsored by the uh, Interfaith Dialogue Association, with a Kaufman event. <clears throat> and that's because the IDA, the Interfaith Dialogue Association, and the Kaufman Institute have now merged. We are one organization. We are so pleased to have the Interfaith Dialogue Association a part of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. And I'm going to ask Fred Stella to come and say a few words about the Siegel Lectureship, which will be followed by the introduction to our speaker by Katie Gordon, who is the program manager for the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. Fred? Thank you very much, Doug. Rabbi Philip Siegel was an amazing man. I don't know if I'd be able to say that we wouldn't be here without him, but I'm pretty confident in saying that if he did not exist here in Grand Rapids, that the interfaith community would not have coalesced as quickly as it did at the time that it did. I wish I'd had more interactions with uh, the gentleman. Uh, he, he was, I believe, unique. Uh, he came here about uh, three decades ago, a little over three decades ago, and he was the rabbi for the conservative Ahavas Israel Synagogue for a few years, and in that time, he really started to stir the interfaith pot. He himself was a New Testament scholar. He believed that if you wanted to understand first century Judaism, you had to understand some parts of the New Testament. And he was all about bringing people together. He had very uh, small conferences at the synagogue. Uh, and I remember one that I attended. And, and again, these were not attended by large numbers of people, but I do remember one panel that I'd heard about, and it was really dipping my toe into the interfaith scene. There was a, uh, there was a Catholic, a Protestant, and a Jew. They were really walking on the wild side back then. That, <laughs> that's about as interfaith as things got. And uh, I remember that there was something, there was a twinkle in his eye, there was a, there was a bit of a joie de vie about him, and I, I knew I could get away with this. Again, I did not know him, but during the Q&A, people were talking about Jews going to churches to teach churches how to put on Passover seders, uh, which is a really wonderful tradition. And so after a bit of 
Q&A on that, I, I raised my hand and I, I asked the rabbi, I said, you know, it's, all, it's wonderful that, that uh, Jews are doing this, going to Christian churches and teaching them how to do Seder. But I said, you can only go so far until you also have to teach them not to, not to make pastrami sandwiches on white bread with mayonnaise. <laughs> and he looked at me, he laughed, and he said, you're not from around here, are you? I was a recent transplant from Detroit, and he says, yeah, that, that works now. Um, so anyway, we are very excited. As, as uh, Doug mentioned, the Interfaith Dialogue Association, we are now a part of Kaufman Interfaith Institute. Uh, for the past few years, the Siegel Lecture has been a biannual event, and we are going to do our very utmost to make sure that this is a, an annual event from this point forward so that this man, Philip Siegel, who worked so hard to accomplish what we are in the process of accomplishing, that that, that memory doesn't fade. I don't have any other recollections. I can't even tell you what the conference at the synagogue was about that year. All I know is at the end, the Christian, the, the Protestant, the Catholic, and the Jew left the synagogue walked into a bar, and hilarity ensued. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for coming here. And now Katie Gordon will do the introductions. I'm not Katie Gordon. I don't remember if I introduced myself or not, but I'm Doug Kinchy, the director of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. And before Katie introduces our Siegel Lecture, I want to acknowledge earlier today, we recognize the 2016 Interfaith Leadership Awardee. And he's with us tonight, and I want to acknowledge again and introduce, although I don't think any of you need introduction, to our former mayor, George Hartwell, who has been a great supporter of interfaith activity. And George, would you please stand and be acknowledged again? Now the real Katie Gordon will come forward. <laughs> Hi, everyone. As Doug said, I'm the program manager of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute, and I have the pleasure of introducing my friend Jen Bailey tonight. Named one of the 15 faith leaders to watch in 2015, Reverend Jennifer Bailey is an ordained minister, community organizer, and emerging national leader in, multi -faith, in the multi-faith movement for justice. As the founder and executive director of the Faith Matters Network, Jennifer believes that people of faith can be game changers in the fight to build a more just, compassionate, and peaceful world. She comes to this work with nearly a decade of experience combating intergenerational poverty in her hometown of Chicago and her, in her adopted home of Nashville, Tennessee. A child of the food justice movement, Jennifer worked to increase access to public benefits for food insecure families in Middle Tennessee and organized residents of food deserts to advocate for transformational public policies in their communities. After years of listening deeply to the stories of community members living with hunger, Jennifer realized that the immediate issue of food insecurity was a symptom of a much larger issue, structural economic injustice. At the same time, she noted that the regions of the county with the greatest economic disparities are also the areas with the highest rates of religious participation in the United States. And the Faith Matters Network was born. A Truman Scholar, Jennifer earned degrees from Tufts University and Van Vanderbilt University Divinity School. She's an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the oldest, the oldest historically black denomination in the United States. And on a more personal note, since we're both alumna of the Interfaith Youth Corps, I got to meet Jen over two years ago, and it's been a joy and inspiration to follow the work that she does in Nashville and nationally across the country. The leadership that she's provided for fellow interfaith advocates across the country as she helps articulate this field as real justice work makes her a leading voice in our movement, and I'm so excited for her to share some of those stories and lessons with all of you tonight. So with that, please help me welcome Jen to the stage. Good evening. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. I, I now live in the South, so I say y'all, so. 
First, I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation. I have been so deeply moved by the people that I've had the opportunity to interact with this afternoon, to hear the stories, the deep stories of the interfaith work that's happening in Grand Rapids from the year of interfaith understanding to the year of interfaith service. <laughs> my heart got a little pitter patter, y'all. <laughs> And also, thank you so much to my home folks, my peoples, um, to the local AME Church for your award. I, I feel so grateful, and I feel grateful to be with you all tonight. I'm a storyteller, so instead of standing behind the podium, I'm going to tell some stories tonight. Stories about the intersection of interfaith and racial justice. My story begins at the confluence of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. In geography, confluence is used to refer to the meeting of two great bodies of water. Often, when you see from above the confluence of rivers, it's an interesting sight. They either remain separate, each with their own distinct colors and sediments, or they begin to blend together. In the spring of 1950, my grandmother, Harriet, got off a Greyhound bus at the confluence of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers in Cairo, Illinois. She was from a little town in northern Florida called Quincy, Florida, a town at that time which had been facing some pretty serious issues. You see, when my grandmother was growing up in the 1930s and 40s in northern Florida, it wasn't a safe place for a little black girl. In 1943, as Hitler's bombs rained down over Germany, my grandmother woke up at nine years old to hear news that one of her neighbors had been lynched and left, sprawled out on a bridge in town. My grandmother was escaping at that time what I would call a state of racial terrorism in the South. A state of racial terrorism which limited her opportunities because of who she was embodied to be. Limited opportunities to economic growth, to educational access. So she boarded that Greyhound bus, leaving behind the land that her grandfather had tilled for years. The land and the red dirt clay where she had grown up, where her grandfather had built a little church that she worshiped in every Sunday. She boarded that bus believing that she could have a better future in the North and became part of the story of the second great migration. Now, when she got off that bus in Cairo, Illinois, she didn't know that three years later, at the confluence of those rivers, my mother would be born. My mother, Christine, born in 1953, was a new generation of young African American. She grew up the first integrated class in her high school in 1968. For those of you who are students of history, you know that the Brown decision happened over a decade later. But sometimes in our narratives of history, we forget that equality and justice takes a while to move. When my mother walked into her high school the first day, she was greeted with National Guardsmen in her small southern Illinois town because there had been bomb threats in her city. She became a part of a generation of young people who went to college, Southern Illinois University, go Salukis. <laughs> then moved north to Chicago with the promise of a brighter future. That's where she met my dad. And several years later, as happens, I was born. And we moved to another river town, Quincy, Illinois. From Quincy, Florida to Quincy, Illinois. <laughs> right up that river. <laughs> I was born in 1987. I am a millennial. I have no memory of the Soviet Union. I don't know a time in my life when there wasn't a personal computer somewhere nearby. But I began school in 1992, 
the same year that Rodney King captured the national imagination and started a new type of conversation of what race relations would be like in the United States. Now, Quincy, Illinois, while a great opportunity for my college-educated parents, was a difficult place to grow up. It was 95% white, 5% all other, all other. <laughs> And one of my earliest experiences in my school was being told that I was dirty, because why else would my skin be brown? That early experience of direct racism endowed of me a sense of deep empathy for those who are other. So it was no surprise when I moved to Chicago from high school in 2001, September of 2001, that when the Twin Towers came down and I saw on the TV screen that people who were brown like me were suddenly our enemies, I thought the one place that I would hear a message of hope, a message of unity would be that church, my church, which for me growing up was the one place where it felt safe to be brown like me and embodied like me in the world. But that's not what I heard from my pulpit. What I heard is that Muslims were our enemies. There was something fundamentally wrong with them. That was not the gospel that I knew. That was not the gospel that I felt in my heart. So I sought alternative opportunities for my theological education, not knowing at that point that I would eventually go to seminary. But I was curious. So I kept probing and asking questions. Those questions led me to an organization called Interfaith Youth Corps. I became one of their first young people, um, an IFYC OG, as they call us now. <laughs> and I got to know people like Adina, a conservative Jew from my rival high school in Chicago. She told me about the Torah and how she was gonna take a year off to study it in Israel. Mostly we talked about prom dresses and graduation, but at a time when I was wrestling with my own faith identity, Adina became a force for me to think about my own text again, to think about my own faith again. I met people like Umar, a Pakistani Muslim who loved hip hop as much as me, and as we were doing service together, I got to know about Islam as a religion of peace. And my eyes and my ears and my heart was opened to what the world could look like in an era where rainbow-colored codes were dictating our levels of safety, in an era where war was raging, was raging and tearing apart communities, not just abroad, but in the low-income communities that my people lived in. Beloved, I believe that we are at a confluence moment. We know that religious diversity in the United States has never been higher. Harvard professor Diana Eck talks about America being perhaps the most religiously diverse nation in human history. That force is meeting us at the same time that America is becoming more racially diverse than ever before. Two mighty forces coming together. The question is whether or not they will become intricately woven in seamlessly into the narrative of what it means to be an American, or if, as the news would have you believe, we are destined to be divided. Now, I firmly believe that to understand the phenomena of what's happening today, we have to begin to explore these issues at the intersections, at the confluence of our identity. I stand today not just as a black woman, although that's important to me, but as a daughter, as a child of the Midwest, as an expat in the South. 
and most of all as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one identity speaks over and above the other. When I come to the table working on issues of justice, I have to bring the fullness of who I am to the table. Now, I believe that we are at a critical moment in our nation's history when presidential candidates can gain votes by saying that they, need, they will register Muslims, when violence is applauded at rallies, when young black and brown people stand up and claim that they matter, we're at a pivotal turning point. And I believe that as people of faith, as beloved of God, we have the tools and the resources to begin modeling something new. Now, I'm going to be real with you all. We're living in some dark times, <laughs> some dark days, dark days, dark days. <laughs> in the Christian tradition, we just uh, finished up our Holy Week. Easter Sunday was last Sunday. And I've been thinking a lot about what happens before Easter Sunday during Holy Week. You have Good Friday, you have this traumatic moment where Christ is, is crucified. But then you have the silence of Holy Saturday. Christ is dead. We don't know what's coming. We don't know if he's coming back. I think we're in a Holy Saturday moment right now. A moment where it's not clear what direction we're heading or going. But I believe we have the tools and the resources to embody what I call a theology or ethic of accompaniment with communities that need it the most at this time. For me, the theology of accompaniment or ethic of accompaniment is deeply Christian. It's based in my sacred text. When I think about the theology or ethic of accompaniment, I think about a, a Bible scripture I used to quote during Sunday school. For those of you who've participated in youth group activities, sometimes you're pointed at and asked to recite a Bible scripture. And what happens when you don't know what Bible scripture to say? You say, Jesus wept. <laughs> The shortest verse in the Bible, the words Jesus wept, are often pivoted to when you can't remember what else to say. I believe in a theology of accompaniment for showing up for people who are different than us. Jesus wept actually has a lot to teach us. You see, in the biblical narrative, in the Christian narrative, Jesus wept comes at a time when Lazarus is dead, Jesus' close friend. Mary and Martha, his sisters, are upset. Jesus gets there late, and they say, if you had been here, my brother would still be alive. And instead of raising Lazarus immediately, Jesus sits with them, and Jesus weeps with them. Theologically, I've been sitting with this a lot, because I've been crying a lot the past year, y'all. I've been crying when news of another unarmed black man being shot and killed enters my news feed on Facebook and Twitter, millennial. <laughs> when videos of death go viral over and over and over and over and over and over again, I lean into Jesus what because I have to believe that as a Christian, Jesus wept means that Jesus is with me in the midst of my grief. There's a lesson for us in that. When communities are in a place of deep lament, when we don't know what to do or say, sometimes what's required is our presence, is our accompaniment is the breaking open of our heart to feel in the deepest wells of our soul that grief. The good news in the biblical narrative is that Jesus does raise Lazarus from the dead. It's a good, it's a good end to the story. 
But that pause, that moment of grief is one of the most important moments, I think, in teaching us what an ethic of accompaniment can look like. When I think about a theology or ethic of accompaniment in this moment, in this tense, this dark, dark moment, I look to examples from other faith traditions. I look at the example of Fatima Knight. Who's Fatima Knight, you say? In June of last year, many of us will remember, on June 18th, it was a Wednesday, I remember, because before I went to bed, I checked Twitter, as any good millennial does, and I saw news pouring out of Charleston, South Carolina. There had been a shooting at an AME church. As news rolled across my news feed, I found out more details. I found out that it was at Mother Emanuel AME church. Mother Emanuel, a historic, a historic church in my denomination, which was known as a bastion of civil rights, which was known as historically living into the, the ethic and the narrative of my faith tradition. You see, the AME Church was founded in 1787 in protest to racial injustice in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There are a lot of important things happening in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1787. Constitution was being written. <laughs> so the founding of the AME Church predates the founding of the American Republic. At the time, blacks and whites at, were worshiping together at what was then St. George Methodist Episcopal Church. Black members of the denomination were told that they could not kneel and pray because they were less than white members. So in protest, the founder of our faith, Richard Allen, went and knelt and prayed, got up and left, starting the first historically black denomination in the United States. Mother Emanuel was founded not too many years after as one of the first churches in the southern United States. It was a church known to be a church with a rich history of resistance to racial injustice. That Wednesday evening after a church conference, the saints of God gathered for Bible study and did what most Christians are taught to do. They welcomed the stranger. In this case, the stranger came in the form of a 20-year-old young man named Dylan Roof. Dylan Roof, a young man who was raised in a mainline Christian denomination, the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Dylan Roof, who was confirmed in that church, sat across from black Christians and Bible study, people who shared his sacred text for an hour, reading the word of God before pulling out a gun and killing nine black Christians. I heard stories from inside the sanctuary because it's only one or two degrees of separation from every person. Who, I'm only one or two degrees of separation from every person who died that night. I heard stories that didn't make the news, like Reverend Clementa Pigney's daughters were present with his wife and hiding in his study as their father was killed. I heard stories about a young six-year-old girl who was told to play dead to live. In the wake of Charleston, our national consciousness was once again awakened to the realities of racial injustice and hatred in this nation. Many people didn't know what to do, staring at their TV screens, feeling helpless. After Charleston, news reports would show that a spate of burnings of black churches would happen throughout the South, all of which went grossly underreported. Yet, watching the news from her apartment in Brooklyn, a young black Muslim woman named Fatima Knight decided that during the holy month of Ramadan, there was nothing more sacred that she could do than to raise money to rebuild black churches in the South. And she did. 
well over $75,000. That is the embodiment of an ethic of an accompaniment with someone who doesn't look like you, who may not share your same core beliefs, but from the very wells of their being, from the very wells of their tradition, believes wholeheartedly that we as a people are each other's business. Fatima Knight showed me what it means to show up, to show up in some of the darkest moments, to be present for others. Not a lax presence, but to truly be invested and know that what is at stake in this question, in this dark time and at this dark moment is a matter of life and death. That's why I try to show up. And through my work at the Faith Matters Network, we show up. We show up in places like Nashville, Tennessee, where Muslim communities are regularly ostracized, marginalized, and made to feel like they don't belong. We show up and walk alongside those folks. I'll leave you with this story of hope. I told you I'm going to get back to hope, right? <laughs> it's a dark moment, but there is hope. This story about the first time I died. What is the first time you died? Jennifer, you're alive. Are you a ghost? Are you an apparition? Are you a zombie? What's going on here? The first time I died was on the floor of the U.S. Capitol cafeteria. My death was a part of a die-in, one of the strategic actions and most popular actions of the Black Lives Matter movement. For those of you who don't know, a die-in happens when people lay on a floor, bodies prostrate for four minutes, representing the four hours that Michael Brown's body laid on the hot altar of concrete and pavement in Ferguson, Missouri. When I died, I died alongside people of different faiths. Next to me was a rabbi. On the other side was an imam. In front of me was a Baha'i sister. Our actions were a statement, taking truth literally to the halls of power to say that we as a people, as people of faith and leaders of faith, would not stand idly by when one more person <laughs> was oppressed, marginalized, or a victim of institutional and structural racism. After those four minutes, and the Congress people were mad, y'all, they were just trying to get lunch, <laughs> we rose up singing chants and hymns of different traditions and songs, and I felt alive. I felt alive because I knew that in that moment, that symbolic gesture was the antidote to the darkness that I see in the world today, was the beginning of an antidote. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be here a little bit longer. It doesn't mean that the issues of racism or Islamophobia or xenophobia or anti-Semitism are going to be fixed overnight. Whenever people ask me, well, what can I do about racial justice and racism? I say, you know this is a problem that predates the founding of the American Republic, right? By a couple hundred years. The first slave ships arrived in Virginia in 1616. I think we have a long way to go. But it's in these moments of accompaniment, of learning how to show up for one another, and finding the stories from the deepest wells of our faith that we can begin to surface what the next right thing to do is. So I leave you with this message of hope, that we are each other's business. We are each other's bond, and we are the answers that we're seeking. It won't be easy, but the journey itself is worth the fight. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. What an inspiring, inspiring talk for th this evening. Uh, Jennifer is open to questions, so please uh, come down to the mic if so you have a question. My favorite part of giving talks is talking to people afterwards. So talk to me, y'all. I'm even going to sit down here. Just like my legs over. Let's have a conversation as my nine-year-old nephew to be says. <laughs> Hi. Um, I don't know. Do I need to do this? I talk pretty loud. Anyway, um, in Grand Rapids recently, we had a gentleman uh, downtown in our Rosa Parks um, center, right near a statue of Rosa Parks, wandering around saying not very nice things about Muslims. One of them was, kill all the Muslims. Things like that. And this person was arrested, um, and there's a video of this event going around on the news. And when I saw that, my first thought was, I'm going to have to wear a headscarf every time I go down to Rosa Parks from now on. Because <laughs> I guess I felt like you were saying, um, we need to accompany people. Um, I'm always at a loss. I I've, I've been a protester since the early 70s, and I like doing that. It makes me feel empowered. Um, but I'm always looking personally for other kinds of things, like maybe wearing a headscarf down at Rosa Parks Plaza, um, that just can help me feel like I'm accompanying people. Um, and I'm looking for more ideas. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, so I think this question of accompaniment's a really interesting one, right? Um, what it predicates and assumes is the building of deep relationship, which is messy, <laughs> which is messy stuff. It involves us stepping outside of our comfort zones and actually sitting with people and getting to know people, which is why I think some of the work that you guys have been up to around interfaith service is such a beautiful thing. Um, you know, I, I think there's sometimes a, a fine line, right, between in our excitement around accompaniment, sometimes we can dangerously appropriate certain things, right? Um, and so um, when I think about the beauty of hijab, right, um, and how sacred that is to many of my Muslim sisters, that's not something that I would take on, right? Um, not because I, 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 uh, I think there are other better ways for me to accompany people than, than that, but I think there are other even public displays for me to accompany people. Um, but I think it begins with a cultivation of deep relationships, right? It begins by showing up at, at um, interfaith events thrown by the, <laughs> the Kaufman Interfaith Institute and others to build a, a sense of who folks are. It begins by breaking bread. So I come from the food justice movement, which means I like to eat a lot, but also <laughs> means that in a very real way, the sacredness of table, I think about a lot. I'm also a Christian minister, so table, you know, communion, all of that is very deep and resonant in my theology. Um, so, so I think there, there, there are a couple of layers to what it means to do authentic accompaniment versus um, shallow work, right? It, any of us can show up in a hijab someplace and say we're accompanying others. It's another thing to um, learn how to accompany while allowing other people to lead, right? To allow, um, when, I think about, when I think about Black Lives Matter, which is a movement that I've been active in, in the past two years, right? Part of that work and part of this, the, the wrestling with, <laughs> I've been doing with some of my, um, my white brothers and sisters is, helping them learn how to step back, when to step back and when to step up. And I include um, among those white brothers and sisters my nice Jewish boy that I'm marrying from Nashville, Tennessee, right? And I live this interfaith thing out in my personal life too. <laughs> um, and so, and so I, I hope that, that gives you some ideas. Part of it's about like creating spaces for authentic relationship, for breaking bread, to make sure that the level of accompaniment that you're encountering is not shallow, but actually, actually deep. And I know that can also be hard in communities where there's not necessarily a lot of diversity, right? Um, I think one of the reasons why we continue to have issues around racial justice in this country, one of the very simple reasons why is because we don't live next to each other, right? 
And there are systems and policies and history to why we don't live next to each other when we think about redlining and the history of that. Um, but it is a risk. It is a risk to step outside of what you know because the risk is that you might just be transformed. And that is uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable. Uh, Dan Pearson, Jennifer. I was looking at the title, um, Racial and Interfaith Justice, A New Vision. So the vision is one of accompaniment. I'm just trying to understand. For leadership at the intersections. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I got the intersections of the two rivers. Mm -hmm. But can you broaden that? I mean, what do we, all of us here are leaders. Mm -hmm. What are the intersections that you, you would be highlighting or uh, suggesting? Yeah, so I think there's two types of intersections that I'm talking about. Um, there's, a, there's a movement called intersectionality that when we think about um, issues of oppression, particularly in the United States, um, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a professor at UCLA in Columbia, has talked a lot about how we can't consider those things in a vacuum, right? Whether we're talking about Islamophobia or racism or sexism or classism, that those types of oppressions exist at the intersections of all of those identities, right? So, so that my showing up, my theology or ethic of accompaniment is not just rooted in my interest in one particular thing, but sees how that one thing I'm showing up for is connected to many others. And then there's a second part to that, that is that we embody those intersections, right? And the realities of what our identities are and who we are. Um, and so that's when we, when we think about intersections, when I think about intersections, there's both the intersection of the river, which is a symbolic bringing together of things, right? There's also the intersections as we think about our identities and who we are shaped and formed to be and the oppressions that we're fighting against in the world. So many dimensions. Yeah, it's just nuanced. And I think that's one of the, the questions that 21st century movement building is asking in a new way is we had these sort of identity marker categories of movements. You had the LGBT movement, which was separate from the black liberation movement, which was separate from the feminist movement. But what happens if I am a queer black woman, right? For whom all of those issues are not only salient, but relevant and important to me. Um, and so I think that whether we're talking about immigration and mass incarceration, all of those things intersect. And part of the danger is often that we toss those things yeah. aside. Yeah. I think you and Pope Francis would be good friends yeah. uh, because um, when you read the recent documents over the past three years and much of his you know, the different letters and apostolic ex exhortations, and I know we're going to see it in his forthcoming one on the family, mm -hmm. one of the key themes is we accompany people on the spiritual journey. We don't have to have the answers, but we have to be present and to accompany them. Yeah, so, as, so as you mentioned that tonight, I said, right on. Yeah. You and Pope Francis. So I'll tell you, my, <laughs> my dad grew up Catholic on the south side of Chicago. So part of my influence in life is that I grew up with a Catholic father and a Baptist mother, and they didn't know what to do with me, so I went to the AME church. Um, so. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Hi, I'm Charlie Honey. Uh, since you've identified yourself as a millennial and you get all your news from your Twitter feed and all those sorts of things, you know, a lot of, a lot of millennials are really not into organized religion at all. In fact, they, and they would say, you know, what's this interfaith jazz, uh, interfaith justice jazz? Religion itself is actually the problem. We shouldn't be seeking religious solutions. What do you say to that point of view? So I, I think... There's a, there's a two-part answer to that question that, one, if you look at the demographic breakdown of who, those who identify as spiritual and not religious, actually only a very small percentage of them identified as out-and-out -out atheists, right? So I think part of what we're seeing and part of the trends that we're seeing um, are that millennials are craving new types of religious formation and spaces for community. Now, for some, that may not come doctrinally in the form of a church or in the form of a mosque or in the form of a synagogue, but they're creating those communities. And I'll tell a quick story. One of the places I've seen this happen and show up most is actually in seminaries right now, 
which is a fascinating place that you wouldn't expect it. Um, at Vanderbilt Divinity School, where I graduated from in Nashville, Tennessee, only about a third of people graduating from that school actually go into ordained formal parish ministry now. A lot of people are seekers, a lot of people are agnostic, but what they're seeking and finding is a deep yearning for and desire to find some type of deep spiritual practice to accompany their work. What's happening, I mean, Nashville's a very weird town. I love it, that's why I'm there, especially in a very deeply red state. Um, Nashville's a little dot of blue. But what's been interesting over the past 10 years is to see the way in which people who graduated from seminary education had then gone on to lead movements like Occupy Nashville and Black Lives Matter Nashville. And now we're seeing some of the, the work around the DREAM Act in Tennessee was happening. People went off to lead that. Some of our um, worker centers were started by Divinity School graduates. And activists are now, people who were on the front lines are now coming back to seminary. So I point to that as an example, not to say that everybody in my generation actually believes in a particular type of organized religion, but I do think there's a misunderstanding of what that phenomenon is actually about. I think that millennials crave a deep sense of spirituality. I think millennials crave a deep and are committed to a deep sense of community, right? What they find themselves resistant to often are the politics of institutional religion, right? For a lot of folks, um, to be quite honest, LGBT issues really drove them from institutions, institutions that they grew up in because they were resistant to um, the, the stance that their particular doctrinal positions were taking on that. That doesn't mean that they don't, for some of my Christian friends who've left the church, don't still believe in God. Some of my favorite pastors are trans men and women who come out of these sort of oppressive structures who are now starting their own faith communities. So I think there's some pretty interesting research and reports coming out around that particular population. And I actually think it's our movement activism that is driving us to ask broader questions about, about wholeness and wellness, right? Like where spiritual traditions have long histories around that. Um, that's a huge movement within Black Lives Matter is around like healing justice. What does it mean for us to do self-care and care for ourselves as, act, as a political actor, right? Um, and it's pulling in spiritual practices to do that. Um, I think that people are creating new communities. I have a friend who is a gay, a gay half Asian man in Minneapolis who's now starting a, plant, a church plant um, focused on environmental justice in the Twin Cities, right? So we haven't given up, y'all. I know that there's like panic <laughs> in, in religious institutions that all millennials are leaving and that we don't want anything a part of institutional religion. I just don't, I don't think that's a shining light on how complex <laughs> these issues actually are. Hi. Hi. So there are faith communities that represent what you're talking about, and they're not, there aren't people flocking to them either. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, what are, you, what are you asking people to give up? in this kind of new vision of coming together. So people who are rooted in faith tra traditions, what are you asking them to kind of like put on the shelf? Mm -hmm. And people outside of faith traditions, what are you asking them to kind of just hold off on for a little bit for the sake of a company, yeah, so, if that makes sense? So what I actually want is something a little bit more radical than that because I think that, that the and I might get like, nobody hurt me for saying this. But I think actually some of the traditional interfaith models that I was raised in asked me to give up a lot to participate in an interfaith dialogue table, right? They asked me to come as a Christian and Christian only, not understanding that my Christianity was formed out of a particular racialized experience in the United States. I'm actually not asking people to give people stuff up. I'm asking them to bring the fullness of who they are to that process of accompaniment, right? That's the intersectional work, right? It's bringing the fullness of who you are, the fullness of your identity, the fullness of your tradition, being able to disagree in the process and hold each other lovingly to that, um, which I, I think might actually be a little bit of a different model for doing interfaith work. Um, I was having a conversation earlier today that about some of the other models of interfaith work that's, that have existed over the past 30 years, some of which like, I love, love, love um, my 
middle-aged white hippie brothers and sisters who like have this vision of like interfaith oneness who like African drum circles and have their like interfaith celebrations, right? That's a particular model of interfaith work that has existed for a very long time. Um, I think there are particular dialogue models that again ask people to come as a Christian solely without recognizing the nuance there. So I think in this process of accompaniment, it's not about what you're giving up, it's about bringing the fullness of who you are and an openness to transformation. So I guess if, if there's anything, it's an openness to be transformed in the process of encountering the fullness of who someone else is, right? Um, which I don't know if it's giving, if that's asking people to give anything up or just opening themselves up a little bit broader to, to knowing that in my getting to know you, I might be different after that encounter. And for me as a Christian, because I, Above all, I do identify as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Like, I am, I am Christian, <laughs> and that's not going anywhere. Even in the midst of my being in an interfaith relationship and marriage, right? He knows that. He knows that I preach on Sunday, right? Um, for me, that's a deeply theological question. For me, it's in getting to know people who are radically different than myself, who bring the fullness of themselves to the table, that I get to know a little bit more about God that I get to know a little bit about the face of God. And I encounter that even when I'm like lovingly going back home to West Central Illinois and encounter the people who I grew up with who are supporters of Donald Trump, right? They stretch me to understand in the fullness <laughs> of who they are a little bit more about God. And, and so that's, for me, in my personal sort of journey and call, um, I think interfaith work is an amazing methodology and strategy and radical way of getting to know more about God and in the language of my tradition, bringing about the kingdom of God here on earth, a little snapshot of what heaven can be. Um, and I say that as a Christian, right? And I recognize that in a different tradition that might have different language. I was on the phone with a friend two days ago who um, identifies as agnostic completely <laughs> and um, is seeking ordination in the Unitarian Universalist Church, right? for whom that language does not make any sense, right? But we can still journey together and work together and accompany one another on that journey um, towards a more just and beautiful world. Um, so, that's, is that too crazy? Am I crazy? <laughs> Jennifer, you have challenged us, you have inspired us, and we thank you so much for being here. Thank thank you. You. Still dessert in the back. Continue the discussion.